Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about Alexander Hamilton and his views on debts and banks and so forth here. So early on, we're going to see basically some of the political parties being formed out of Alexander Hamilton's views versus Thomas Jefferson's views, either dealing with the Constitution or relating to uh, a national bank or debts. So as you can see here, um, if you look at the second bullet point or major point, he urged the federal government to pay its debts at $54 million dollars and try to pay them off at face value. That's known as funding at par plus interest, um, and as well as assuming the, de the debts of the states at this point, which is about $21.5 million, and that's going to be known as assumption. So basically, after the war, um, there's a lot of debts out there that was borrowed um, through various uh, ways and so forth, either foreign debts as well as domestic d debts, and some of the states kind of took on these debts. One of the states that's going to have a huge debt is going to be Massachusetts because a lot of the fighting occurred in Massachusetts, and that's why you can see um, the currency problems and the economic struggle that was going on there and taxes, which led to Shays' Rebellion. On the other hand, you got Virginia that didn't have as much debt because they weren't as heavily involved in the actual fighting of the war. So they didn't incur as many debts. So kind of like why should the nation pay off um, the debts of Massachusetts while the South essentially didn't have as much spending have to flip the bill for them. So this is kind of one of those things that goes back and forth, um, and then eventually there's going to be a bargain that's made between this, and essentially what happens is in order for us to assume those debts, um, according to Hamilton's plans, uh, they're going to move the capital to the District of Columbia, as we'll see that the first capital was found in New York. That's where Washington is sworn in. Um, so this funding at par, we gain support of the rich, the federal government, not the state. So this seems to be in the interest of the wealthy, not in the common person that was usually represented by Jefferson. Okay, one way of trying to raise revenue, as we've always seen, is through custom duties and excise taxes. Um, and these are things that are hotly debated issues, um, even today when we talk about taxes and customs duties and tariffs and things like that. So we have this huge debt that has been incurred with $75 million, and Alexander Hamilton actually thinks this is a good thing, because when you have debt, that means you owe people money. And when you owe people money, they're very invested in your future, and they hope for your success so that you can pay back those debts. So seeing that that is an asset because they're invested in our future, he thinks that we're actually okay. So one of the things that they're going to do early on to help pay off some of these debts is to create what is known as a custom duty or a tax on things coming into our country. Another thing that that is supposed to help is, as a result of that, help promote manufacturing domestically. So if prices of goods coming from England are increased due to the fact that we're putting a tariff on them or a customs duty, it means that we can compete with those countries a little bit better because we're kind of in our nascent or early form of industrialization. So he's trying to help out these infant in industries that are usually found in the north. At the same time, he also created what is known as an excise task, tax on, most notably, whiskey at seven cents per gallon. And we're going to see how this eventually erupts into a problem known as the Whiskey Rebellion. Another idea that creates this uh, growth of political parties between Hamilton and Jefferson is dealing with a national bank. So Alexander Hamilton having his ties to England and the Bank of England believes in a strong national treasury um, that's going to have this national bank. Um, but the problem with this is going to be that it's not actually seen in the Constitution. So Hamilton's views on this is if it was not forbidden in the Constitution, it's actually allowed. He's going to use the necessary and proper clause from the Constitution um, to kind of create this idea or elastic clause. This is a loose uh, interpretation of the Constitution, and then he believes it falls into the necessary and proper clause when dealing with the Constitution in regards to Congress. Um, Jefferson, on the other hand, thinks that the bank should be forbidden, that it should remain amongst the states, and that it falls into the Tenth Amendment, and that not mentioned in the Congress, or in, rather in the Constitution, should fall under the states, and he has a strict interpretation. But eventually the bank will be constructed um, and created for a 20-year charter, and Washington will actually sign it into law. So that's going to happen in 1791. So as I mentioned, these become kind of the uh, turning points that create the emergence of political parties with the Federalists on one side and the Jeffersonian Democrats on the, on, uh, Jeffersonian Democrats on, the, uh, the, on the other side. So basically what we have here, Hamilton's policies, the National Bank, how he deals with the Whiskey Rebellion, the excise tax that created that Whiskey Rebellion, all seem to be kind of infringing or encroaching on states' rights. And this is where we start seeing the political parties develop between Hamilton and Jefferson in this hatred that will last for quite a while. And that's going to end today's lecture.